Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, wherever you may happen to be, and whether you're watching live or archived, and welcome to another in the series of Nautel Transmission Talk Tuesdays. I'm going to give myself a pat on the back. I think we're going to stop keeping score. I think we're right more than we're wrong. I probably said we were going to stop keeping score last week, but hey, I'm proud. Going to have a little fun this week. It's starting to get to the point where, let's see, Western Eastern Nova Scotia just had their first snowfall advisory for this coming weekend. Yeehaw, that point in time is coming. If you're in the northern climates, and by northern, I've seen snow in uh, McAllen, Texas before. Not real common, but it happens. Uh, anyway, we're going to talk about uh, getting your site ready for the change in the seasons. If you're from the southern sites, it's a good set of tips for just basic routine maintenance scheduling. So it'd be useful for that as well. Got a couple of guests with me today. Uh, I'm going to go in reverse order from the screen just because I can, but uh, our uh, old standby, Alex Hartman, who uh, I usually call on anytime I uh, want to ask anything about a transmitter site or just about anything else. Alex, welcome. Thanks, Jeff. And last and certainly not least, because he is not just representing himself, but the entire state of Michigan, we've got Dan Kelly, Director of Technical Services for the Michigan Association of Broadcasters. And Dan went out and polled all of the engineers in Michigan to see what they suggested. And you're going to hear a lot of their suggestions today. So Dan, welcome and thanks. Glad to have you. Thanks for having me. All right. So obviously, we've got the usual housekeeping stuff. We're going to uh, flip uh, flip ahead of screen. Sorry, I'm looking at the uh, comments and uh, giggling a little in the background, but uh, oh, uh, by the way, uh, Alex, your boss says nice chair. So oh, uh, thanks. <laughs> Alex was complaining about his back and went out and bought a new chair. So I, I guess it's been approved by the powers that be. It's, a, it's official now. John Antonuk over in uh, Fairbanks says that it's 29 Fahrenheit there this morning. So I guess this is uh, a very appropriate topic. Uh, I did see that we were uh, posted on the Alaska Broadcasters page not long ago. So it's uh, yeah, it, uh, I'm going to expect to hear some input from you guys because uh, you know winter as well as we do, if not better. Standard housekeeping stuff. If you've got a question or a comment, criticism, concern, or just want to throw some shade or some sarcasm at me, there's a question box. Open it up, type your thing. I'll see it pop up on the screen. If it's not too untoward, I may even bring it up. Uh, we try to answer everything by all means. If you've got a microphone and feel like chatting, there's a little hand raise the icon there. You click on that. We can unmute you and bring you into the conversation. More the merrier, and you folks know more, more about this stuff than I do. I'm just the guy that pulls it all together some days, somehow. Okay. I don't think I have changed this in the 16 or so. Oh, also forgot. Um, back to the title slide in your mind. We uh, missed Ed Sylvester, our disembodied voice, the uh, guy that really makes all this stuff happen. He's the, the one that works the magic with all the invites and uh, works with the marketing team on the publicity. And Ed's profile picture changes every week. It's never Ed. Um, so if you can tell me who was Mr. Disembodied Voice this morning on the title slide, which we did leave up there for a while, and William Harrison's got it. I think that's two for William already. So yeah. uh, there you go. Iggy Pop it is. Uh, stay tuned <laughs> next week. We'll see who's representing Mr. Disembodied Voice. You know, a lot of us just didn't recognize him with a shirt on, but that's a, a whole different uh, story. Um, before we even get started, Mark Forrest is telling me that he spent last Thursday starting with winterizing his sites and, and the site hardest to get to has already seen snow. So Mark, we're going to be uh, talking to you a little bit too. Here are the things we're going to be talking about as long as well as anything else you guys come up with. So, you know, whatever you think is appropriate, throw it in there, but uh, just the things to look at, to check, to test, to lubricate, other things you should think about and we'll get rolling from there. Now, before we get too far on, I do want to leave this up. Uh, so Dan, tell me a little bit about how you work this, because I, I just got a big old Excel spreadsheet with a bunch of names and suggestions. Right. Well, actually, that was the hardest part of the job was putting together that uh, Excel sheet for you. But uh, really, about 10 days ago, I just sent out uh, an email to uh, well, a couple dozen engineers in the state and asked for their input. And we've got 10 responses. 
Uh, actually, there was an 11th that came in late yesterday, but uh, we won't go into that. Um, but uh, they all made got their ideas. A lot of I, people had the same ideas, all these names. I mean, there's common ones that you just saw over and over again. But again, there were a few that uh, came up with some unique uh, thoughts and uh, suggestions for uh, winterizing your transmitter sites. So what I've done is sort of collated all the suggestions into topics. And as we get going through, if there are any that uh, somebody had mentioned something specific that jumps out, then uh, by all means. Uh, one thing I do want to mention, because I, I didn't uh, put a slide in for it, but Mar Marvin Walters made a good point. Uh, if you've got a sign system, some of those things, uh, some of their sensors can be somewhat temperature sensitive. So it's a good idea to recalibrate them seasonally. Um, that's something I hadn't been aware of, but I know there are a lot of other pieces of gear that are a little temperature sensitive. So it's a good idea to check those specifically. And, and daylight uh, savings time is the thing with those things. So don't forget to set the clocks. Oh, that's right. We get to fall back in a couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. I can't remember whether I get more sleep or less sleep, but it never feels like enough sleep, no matter which way we go. So <laughs> yeah, yeah, it doesn't matter. It's, <laughs> it's all relative. Well, you've got little kids too. So you know what I mean? Yeah, my body clock is set to theirs. All right, so winter time, we start to lubricate stuff. And a couple of folks had mentioned it. And the funny thing is I've been kicking around transmitter sites for 30 odd years. And I'd never really thought about this, but contactors in AMRAs were a really big one. And uh, that, was, that was a really good point. Uh, one person had mentioned that if you use a wet lubricant, it can tend to bind up when it gets cold. So a lot of folks said dry graphite spray, mm. and, and that was really cool. Uh, Dan, you, you worked AM years and years and years ago, didn't years, you? Years and years and years ago. And the thing is, you really want to do all this stuff. I mean, we're talking about AM arrays, and, and, but you know, with any of this winterizing stuff, do it now so you don't have to do it when it's 10 below and you have trouble getting to the site and because that's the worst time to really try to fix anything so you know winterizing really it's, it's looking ahead to what could go wrong before it does go wrong because you might not be able to get there and when you do you really don't feel like working anyway because it's cold outside yep yep Oh, um, oh on, on the concept of the daylight savings, Rick Jesse says that uh, he's not setting his clock back because one more hour of 2020 is too much. I agree. But, <laughs> I just run standard time all year round, which makes it a really interesting challenge to hit meetings sometimes. Uh, Dennis Christensen mentions on the lubricants that WD-40 is a solvent, not a lubricant. And that is a really, really good point. Uh, WD-40 is good at getting the stuff out of there, but it's not so good at... Uh, grease in the wheels and it will the other thing i found with it i had a uh, car that uh like to seize up the doors every now and again and the wd-40 would uh would really gum the works up a lot yeah, it does get gummy after a while time. it really does yep and you should see what it does at minus 40. <laughs> yeah elaine jones says her dad was a locksmith and said never use anything but graphite in a lock because anything else can gum stuff up and same concept as the wd-40 mm -hmm. Same um, with door hinges. Yeah, and Mark says the same thing. So dry graphite, I know I carry both a, a tube of the powder and you can buy the uh, dry graphite spray. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure. What's the propellant in that, Alex? Do you know? I think it's uh, I think it's CO2. I'm not entirely okay. sure because hmm. I've got the same little thing. It's about this big and it, you know, it, it looks like the old lock de-icer thing, but it's dry graphite. So. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So that's just, uh, that's a, a really good point there. Um, one of the other things that caught my eye was uh, the um, mechanisms, if you've got a steerable satellite dish, and of course, being a radio guy that uh, just feeds fiber, I don't think about satellite a whole lot, but uh, definitely the the worm gears and the, the stuff in a satellite drive would need to be lubricated, and you'd want to specifically use something for low temperature, wouldn't you? Absolutely, yeah, especially awesome. if you've got a, especially if you've got the older style that doesn't have the worm gear, but they have the old gas strut right. system. I think most right. of the radio guys probably have, uh, you know, uh, dedicated dishes for their services, but the TV guys are always shifting around, and you know mm -hmm. that that becomes important. So. Well, even if you've got like an ENG truck, don't forget about those. Just the same. Yeah. Well, and we'll hit vehicles near the end too. The cool thing about this is I know what the slides are, and you guys don't, so I get to play. Uh, <laughs> I get to play surprise all the way through this. Um, 
I beat on generator maintenance a lot and, you know, I, I like to think that I know a little bit about it, but uh, some of the suggestions you guys threw out, uh, Dan, was was really good, uh, especially like um, checking block heaters. That's something that I don't really think about. Yep. You want to keep that thing warm. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Uh, especially if you're a diesel especially. tank. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Well, and, Alex, um, when we were talking, you were talking about the, uh, you know, checking your diesel fuel and make sure that. Yep. Uh, make sure you don't let it sit in the tank for years on end without ever running it or stirring it or working through the fuel because it turns to nastiness just the same. So, you know, make sure you get the tank stirs or, or have it serviced by your generator company. And, you know, you do have to drain that thing every, you know, a year or two. If you haven't run your generator and you put 3,000 gallons of diesel in there, well, you're not going to burn through that unless you're constantly running that thing. So make sure you get the tanksters and conditioners and everything else. Follow the recommended uh, service from the company for, for your generator. Right. You know, yeah. and run your generator once a week or, you know, once mm -hmm. a month if you want, but run it often just so you know. Right, both well, with load and without. Yep. And that's a good point that, uh, that Brad Humphreys bring up or brought up. Uh, when you load test it, uh, test it, test the transfer switch too. pull the power to the building and make everything go through the process. Absolutely. Load test it, not just a, like a resistor bank, but actually move your equipment to it and make sure your equipment reacts properly the way you expect it to. And when the transfer switch doesn't inevitably want to work, make sure you have a nice long broom handle handy. Yep. And, and he says he does that every quarter. Um, John Antonuk mentions uh, number one only, and I assume he's talking fuel grade. Uh, John, just type in real quick. Do you have a microphone you feel like opening up? Because I'm more than happy to unmute you, and you can tell me about that a little bit. This is an area I don't know much about. All right. So if you unmute yourself, you should be able to tell us a story. Go ahead. Good morning. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, only number one fuel. Uh, so it just it gels at cold temperatures, as everybody knows, particularly for number two. And uh, uh, so just uh, uh, one more thing. Yeah, change the, the the filter cartridges on an annual basis. Use water stop block filter cartridges. Um, we run our generators weekly. Uh, we, we don't load test them weekly. I think I do that probably quarterly, but um, yeah, uh, it's been done. And uh, yeah, I've seen the uh, the broom handle thing. That's how I got a new transfer switch at one of my sites. <laughs> yeah, when you bring the station manager over and show them how you have to turn the thing on, you kind of get your way at that point. Yeah, well, anyway, that's uh, this isn't the War Stories episode. But yeah, so it happens. And uh, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> they go hand yeah. in hand. I, I'd seen it uh, cold enough here in Fairbanks where I was concerned about number one gelling. So um that's I've also run into, I don't know about up there in Alaska, but here in Minnesota, certain types of diesel will be dyed a specific color based on what the use is. So if you got you know, like they stopped fuel, doing that, uh, because it was gumming up the works, people would that's be That's exactly it, is if you yeah. got the blue fuel, it would gum up your carburetors and injectors and, and fuel rails because of the, the sediment that the dye creates well, would just... Was, Block it up. I think it was for issues of road tax. You know, you could mm -hmm. you could the road tax if you're burning it for heating. Um, I don't know what the situation was for generators, but yeah, it, it just wound up being a problem. Um, so, and just while I've I've got the microphone, um, yeah, we have heaters on ours. Um, um, the one I think of, you know, I step into one of the enclosure. One of them is in an enclosure. Thankfully, it's not heated, but at least it's enclosed. But the block is heated, and so there's a, a cooling jacket surf pump like an old-fashioned block heater on a car engine and uh, I think it's about a kilowatt and this is a 50 kilowatt uh, generator and so the surf pump runs and it's thermostatically driven and the engine's up to temperature all the time so yep. Yep. Yep, that's the key make sure that it actually runs at temperature don't let it yes. go for 15 minutes and turn it off let it run for an hour or two right Thank you very much for that, John. I appreciate it. Um, Laverne Siemens also mentions uh, make sure your transmitter site UPS units accept generator power, and, and that is a really good point. Uh, so going to tell a little story. Hadn't meant to put it here, but that's okay. It'll fit, and I can. Um, about uh, 
little less than a week ago, we were doing a um, webinar for the CCBE, the uh, Canadian Broadcast or Central Canadian Broadcast Engineers. And maybe two or three minutes into it, all my lights went out. Um, windy day, we had a power outage. Only lasted about 30 seconds, but of course, that was enough for the uh, cable modem to have to reboot. So at, as of right now, everything's running on a UPS. And one of the things I did was size a UPS big enough to run everything for an hour if need to, but also spec it to run with the generator that I've got backing up the house. So uh, definitely that's that's a really good point, Laverne, because there are a lot of UPSs that get uh, persnickety about the generator. And, and that's one of the things Mark Boris mentions that uh, load testing by uh, pulling the power to the site will also let you know what UPSs aren't working. Right, so, uh, I was just gonna get to that. You know, make sure you do fresh batteries. You know, they're not made to last forever. So every couple of years, and what I do is I have a, a silver Sharpie and I write the date on the side of the UPS when I changed the batteries last. So that way you always know how long they've been in there. Yeah, and uh, Mark uh, mentions also that uh, the biggest issue they have with block heaters is rodents too in the power cord, and we'll touch on uh, that, but you notice it's uh, mentioned here as well. I gotta quit swinging my mouse up to the slides so you don't have to see my taskbar all the time. <laughs> but, uh, you know, the mothballs, pest repellents, uh, things like that, whatever you choose. I've had a lot of folks tell, Go ahead, Alex. I was just going to say the other one there that's really important is the hoses. No one ever thinks to grab that radiator hose after 20 years it's been sitting there. See how you squishy know. it is. See yeah. how squishy it is or how baseball batty it is. You mm -hmm. know, it's mm -hmm. just standard. It's better to just do that while you, you can still do it in shorts and a t shirt than a parka and, and, and snowshoes. Well, see if the <laughs> falling apart, you know? Yep, yep. exactly. So having uh, changed the ignition coil in a uh, Jeep Cherokee in a parking lot in the middle of January, I uh, I feel your pain there. Yeah, check this stuff when you can. Oh, there's mm -hmm. a good uh, good suggestion. Uh, William Harrison suggests uh, capsaicin on the electrical cords, basically red pepper extract, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, so that that is a really good idea. I wasn't I wasn't aware of that as a mouse propellant. We use it around the perimeter of our uh, garden to kind of keep the raccoons out. It works really well as any type of pest repellent. The only one that I've seen that will actually cross it is like possums. Mm. For some odd reason, they don't care. <laughs> we don't have a lot of those here. Um, and uh, Alex Lowen mentions the uh, another thing to be aware of is the difference between winter winter fuel and summer fuel, and, and that's a good point. He mentions mm -hmm. diesel specifically, but I know over here on the East Coast we can uh, we've got winter gas and summer gas too. Uh, we do too. Oh, yep. Don't think propane changes. Propane but, doesn't, uh, but if you've got a smaller gasoline-based generator, mm -hmm. um, or even um, sometimes if you're using an LP generator. The utility company will try and purge the lines, and if your generator hasn't run, you might end up with an air bubble in there. Right. So make sure you're running it to make sure you're getting all those those uh get all those bubbles out of there because nothing worse than a backfire on a generator. Right. And I mean, we could talk about generators all day, but let's move forward a slot. And AC. Now, Dan, I'm going to bring you in on this one because uh, a couple of the comments had uh, specifically mentioned AC, and that's not something I really think about during the winter time. You know, buildings still get hot, and uh, you know, you've got you, you, the heat has to go somewhere, and a lot of it's not just going to dissipate on its own. So, yeah, you've got to take a look at the AC units and uh, make sure they're uh, you know, just like the generators, check the belts, the filters, make sure the filters aren't all messed up. The ice shields, you know, it's it's all part of a, you're still going to need AC at some point. Yep. And Snow one of the things as well. Yep. Right. Yep. Yeah. If your inputs are blocked and uh, we'll uh, segue into uh, one of Alex's sites in a moment for this, but um uh, one of the things there, and uh, Mark made a comment about batteries, and Mark, we'll, uh, we'll talk about those in a second too, but uh, I'll keep your comment in mind. Um, one of the other things is if you've got economizers and your economizers get stuck, you can, um, you know, you can, you can heat up a room really well because the air conditioning unit thinks it's bringing in cold outside air when it's not bringing in any air, and uh, then you're pretty soon you're at, uh, what was their record, Alex? 
uh, what was it, 183,000 and change degrees yeah. centigrade? And in that particular case, as I recall, it was... Cooler by uh, the lake. Yeah, we, we're bringing <laughs> it, well, we, that's when we discovered our software didn't roll around to negative numbers. So we went yep. from, uh, holy smokes, it's cold, the surface of the sun. Yep, like I said, cooler by the lake. Yeah. Uh, well, I, I, I've worked with transmitters too that will have a thermal, you know, shutdown if mm -hmm. things get so warm and uh, you know you just don't want that to happen well right in this particular case what had happened is i don't have air conditioner at this site it's a negative pressure cooling so it's an up blast fan in the corner on the roof with a giant wall intake and the the a rare occurrence where the, the thermostat failed on instead of off so on a nice uh december cold minnesota day the fan was constantly running drawing outside air through the building and it got below freezing in the building. And when I got to the site, it was about minus 18 inside the suite. Well, Dottel's transmitters are spec'd from, what is it, Jeff? Zero C to 60 C or something like that, 50 C? Zero to 50, yeah. So, yeah. 30, so when you hit zero degrees to 100. Yeah. yeah, so when you hit zero, it rolls around and this is what you end up with and it shuts down because it thinks it's too hot. Now, Alex has got the dubious distinction of having tested our transmitters at both ends of their specification because it's the same site uh, gotten up to the point where it melted the bezel on the front of the uh, touchscreen. Yeah, on a nice June summer day in Minnesota, it was 97 degrees outside and the fan belt broke on that same uplast fan, not drawing any air through it. And it got quickly up to 150, 160 Fahrenheit in that room. Yeah, and John Antonuk on uh, AC makes another good point. Don't run the compressors below freezing. So definitely if you're in an area that gets that cold, having an economizer system where you can bring the outside air in is, is a huge thing because- uh, Yep, that's almost a requirement in the Midwest. Yep, yep, exactly. Now, oh, flipping ahead, batteries. And this is something that a few people have mentioned and uh, I did mention, oh yeah, look at that. Uh, UPS batteries for sure. Um, mm -hmm. A lot of UPSs self-report. Some of them are better at it than others. Uh, Dan, I know you've had some issue with their, not issue, but experience with UPSs over the years. Uh, what are your thoughts? Anything specific on those? Well, you know, as Alex said before, you know, you want to change the batteries every couple of years, really whether they need it or not, because you don't know how much load they can really handle at, at a certain point. Um, so, yeah, you know, um, unplug them from the wall socket and see what happens, you know. Um, but uh, you know, again, keeping the batteries fresh every couple of years is it will will pay off, and you know, in the end. And and not only not only the batteries themselves too, but uh, the old saying they don't build them like they used to is definitely a truism nowadays. Uh, mm -hmm. The thing that I'm finding more that fails than the batteries is the actual inverters right. inside the UPSs, and they don't they don't monitor for that, you know. So. Right. My general rule is if you've got a battery or UPS that's over five, seven years old, out the door it goes, whether you need a new one or not. You just don't know. I think everybody has their favorite brands of uh, UPSs too. And, you know, you, reading on the, the Facebook uh, broadcast pages, you know, there's some brand bashing going on about certain UPS brands and that sort of thing. And to each their own. But again, yeah, don't let things get too old. Right. Mm -hmm. It's a Chevy Ford thing. And I mean, uh, the, the advantage there is if you've got a double conversion UPS, one where the batteries always provide the power through the inverter and the AC is just used to charge them. Then if you've got an inverter failure, you know pretty immediately because the thing, if it's designed right, will force itself into bypass mode. If I mean, the worst story there is also don't hardware those UPSs for that exact reason without a bypass mechanism. Right. Yep. I've yep. had and, that happen um, where guys will wire in the rack to the battery mm -hmm. and there's no way to take the battery out <laughs> when it fails. Well, and the, and the bypass mechanism in a lot of those UPSs, depending on the brand, is an option, not, uh, not standard. Correct. So, you know, I mean, the one I bought was APC, don't hate on me, but uh, that's what our IT guy recommended and it does include hot battery replacement. Yep. So, uh, yeah, Mark will... Like the, the smoke detectors and CO detectors, very big thing, mm -hmm. especially on the IP connected facilities nowadays. I've got those that are, you know, tied into the uh, the remote control. So I know every which way from Tuesday, if there's a problem. Right. Now, Marco Ruiti makes a really good point. He just changes the batteries every fall with the time change. And I mean, if you do it that way, you're on a schedule, you don't have to think about it. 
The other thing to think about is I bought, for example, a sleeve of uh, CR2032 coin cells. Uh, Alex probably recognizes that part number. Um, and uh, the, they have a shelf life. And if you wait till the five years, that coin cell is probably not going to be kicking out enough voltage for long. So uh, pay attention to the shelf life of your batteries as well, yep. you know, whether rechargeable or alkalines. Yeah. Right. And those those little batteries, those uh, 2032s are in a lot of computer, uh, you know, computers uh, as a backup on the uh, the, the, uh, the motherboard. So you might mm -hmm. want to, if you have any computers in your transmitter facility, you might want to change those out at some point if you if it's been a while. That mm -hmm. that's a good idea. Yeah, especially if it's one that's not powered on on a regular basis, like the transmitter controllers. If the transmitter's always on, the battery will last for years. But if the transmitter's off any amount of time, like a, a cold standby, for example, then mm -hmm. uh, those batteries need to be replaced on a, on a pretty regular basis. So and this isn't really a just a winterization thing. Even the guys, uh, you know, in the southern climates where it's warm, batteries don't like heat just the same. Yep. Uh, you know, so getting it on a schedule. I like the idea of don't don't matter to, in the time change. Just do it. Then it's a it, it's a known plan maintenance thing, so you can schedule it around. I know in some of our transmitters, the batteries are inside the transmitter, so you got to shut the thing down. Yep. To to replace yep. it, and that that can take a little time. Right. So if you make a part of a scheduled maintenance cycle, and and again tying it to the time change gives you a once a year. You know what's been done. You don't have to think about it. And uh, that, that's like a good that. idea. Then, yeah, I've uh, got a couple of comments here about uh, UPSs that just shut down when they fail, not go into bypass, just turn off. So uh, basically, a UPS, like anything else, is a wonderful, wonderful device until it isn't. Um, so the more you can, and William Harrison mentions, he's got it in all caps, bypass switches. So sometimes have an external bypass. It depends how critical, but if something's that critical, maybe you should you need a redundant path as well. So Right. And I've had know. the little 320 watt uh, VA, uh, you, you know, power strip units fail just the same as I've had a 20 kilowatt installed system fail. Uh, the, yep. the, the difference is a couple of zeros in the price tag of repair. <laughs> Yep. Yep. Exactly. So once we've got our batteries done and we've looked at our generator and we've looked at our uh, air conditioning and heating systems, it's probably time to do a little perimeter check. And uh, Dan, uh, I know you've walked around one or two transmitter sites over the years. Uh, this one is uh, one of my particular favorites, although I've seen several others. Yeah, I don't think I've seen something quite like that before. Um, <laughs> that is uh, interesting, uh, to say the least. You you wonder what 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 stress is going to be on those those cables when there's a lot of snow and ice and ugly stuff Add on some it. Wind into the mix. Right. What kind of stress that's going to put on you know the tower and mm -hmm. at the other end the transmitter? It's that's wow. Yep. yep. Did you take so, that in person, Jeff, or? I did. Yeah, if I didn't take the picture, there will be a credit underneath it. Okay. If I did take it, or wow. if I stole it from Alex, then there there won't be. Yeah, um, it looks like there was a lot of people in a hurry there to get something on the air. Well, and this particular one was a leased tower, so it's just everybody added their stuff as they went, and it uh, none of it really got tied together. But yeah, in a windstorm, that uh, that could be an issue. Um, mm -hmm. Obviously, you want to look at your fencing and your signage, uh, light security, and a couple of one one person, Marvin, especially mentioned uh, not just the security lights, but all the lights, the ones in the ATU, any closets, all the bulbs. He said there's nothing worse than getting drug out at three o'clock in the morning in the freezing cold and not being able to see what you're doing. So, uh, so that outlet that, tester, outlet tester is a good thing to carry with you. Uh, a lot of ATUs have a, a 110 outlet inside of them to power test equipment and what have you. More often than not, they're just regular. No one put GFIs in there until recently. And, and a lot of times I'll go out to those sites at three in the morning in, in January because there's something wrong out at the ATU and plug it in. Oh, look, something's wrong. Well, why? Oh, you know, the cord feeding that outlet is chewed through or ice sheared it off or something like that. You, you know, one of those things where, you, you know, multimeter or the, or the uh, outlet tester. 
will tell you right then and there what the problem is and where you need to start digging if that if you need that outlet there or if you got to go back to the truck and grab an extension cord yeah uh, john van milligan mentions they have a spreadsheet with all their ups's on it so they know when to change them because there's too many to do them all at once so they spread it out over the year but they have the spreadsheet to keep track and that's a good system too Right, uh, moving it in, moving it into your planned maintenance schedule instead of an oh crap schedule when you surprise the management with a couple thousand dollars worth of batteries is always a better idea. Yeah. Yep. Well, and and so Dan, that's something else you talk to quite a bit is is planned maintenance versus uh, damage control or putting out fires. Well, right. Again, as I said at the outset of this, you just don't want to be doing stuff in the cold and at a site you really can't get to easily. And uh, so if you have a regular maintenance plan, this is gonna prevent a lot of, you, you have to do a, a big hurry winterizing thing. You'll be doing winterizing throughout the year, I, I, I think. You know, it's, mm -hmm. all this stuff is good to check, but if you have a regular maintenance schedule, then you, uh, this is, becomes less of a burden come, uh, come November. It becomes more of a routine and less of a job, so to speak. Uh, Mark Moore is, uh, yeah, oops, sorry, Alex, go ahead. Okay, so one of the one of the things that I do around here is um, for those guys with AMs in the swamps area, everybody knows it's really hard to mow a swamp in June and, and keep your grass at bay around your anchors and the base of the tower and stuff like that. But the wintertime when it all freezes over, those landscape guys love that phone call because they can get out and play in the snow uh, and take down some of your shrubs for you. So this is, you know, right as we get into, you know, the February, March area where it's it's starting to warm up you know, uh, is a really good time to go down and take care of an AM field, uh, do do that to keep, keep brush control on, uh, at bay. You know, in the yeah. fall, you, you can take a, a note of how tall the weeds are because they're starting to die off. So you know exactly what you're in for come that time frame. Yeah, and in this one, I was torn between this photo and the photo of the AM array with a gate standing supported by two posts, but no fence. And a tree growing through the guy, or a, wire, a guy wire going through a tree. The tree had literally grown around the guy wire. Mm -hmm. Oh, I've so, seen uh, trees go. I, I've seen trees go, grow through towers. You know. Oh yeah. Nice. Creeping Charlie so, and all that. Kudzu loves the towers. Yep. Yeah. Now, one thing about the uh, talking about sealing holes too. Uh, Gary Morrell mentioned uh, that you the, one of the good ways to do it is on a bright sunny day, go into the transmitter building, turn off all the lights, and then look for any um, any bright spots in the walls and the corners, and that that'll let you Do know where you got the best thing ever. Yep. And and I'll add the caveat: uh, use either stainless or copper wool pads. Don't use regular mm -hmm. steel wool because once it oxidizes, the mice will just chew through the foam. Yep. So, yep, that's a, but that was a, a really good point as well. Now, we know where rodents like to go in when it gets cold outside. Yep, yep. they find the warmth. And, yes. I think Marvin became my favorite contributor out of your, uh, out of your bunch of engineers when he suggested that we should also spend some time actually cleaning things. Yes. And uh, so th that was a big deal to me because it's it's something I preach definitely, especially in the northern climates, uh, and not so much for John Antonuk because Fairbanks is 10% humidity all year round. Uh, and Elaine in Tucson, we were arguing yesterday the difference between 3% and 6%. And all I figure was it was the intensity of the nosebleed, but. Uh, right. But uh, yeah, I said up here the you know it's uh, 63 or 66, so who cares? But um, definitely the drier air does mean more static, and uh, so the less dust we've got kicking around, the less chance of an arc. Um, uh, little things like running your backup systems. So we'd already talked about generators and UPSs, but backups in general. If you've got a backup STL or a backup transmitter. All this stuff, it's a good chance if you do a winterizing run to put it on a on part of the maintenance schedule. Um, I know, Dan, a couple of the folks had mentioned uh, checking line pressurization and nitrogen tanks. Again, something that as a transmitter guy, I don't think of much. Yep. Right. Want to keep Especially those if you've got an older, if you've got a tube rig as well, you know, make sure you, when you do run them, you know, dust accumulates on those bottles and it's going to smell funny for a few minutes. You know, make sure you clean those off. Yep. Uh, Dennis Christensen says he has two seasons, winter and getting ready for winter. And uh, not wrong. That's uh, 
No, no. I mean, for us, it's always been almost winter. Winter, still winter, and construction. But uh, I, I think that's similar in Michigan too, Dan. Oh yeah. I like here uh, check hardware because you know you got uh, a blower motor going in mo a lot of transmitters and it's shaking things up inside and you just don't want you want to make sure all the connections are tight because you know what happens when they're not. Right. And I put ground connections because coarse copper does expand and contract. A lot of times we might have uh, steel coated copper wire going to it or or anything. So connections can break loose or work loose. It's a good time to check those. Uh, a couple of folks had mentioned thermal scans of breaker panels, and that's something I definitely beat the drum on. Yeah, until I saw that, I had never thought of that before, but that's a great idea. Yeah, not I've only, got, not only uh, the breaker panel, but if you've got an AM with an ATU or a phaser, Take the thermal imaging camera right to that too. You're going to find your loose connections in there just the same. Yep. Somewhere around here, I've got one of those little uh, um, having a brain fart, but the uh, the little infrared cameras that uh, go right onto your uh, cell phone. The FLIR. FLIR. Thank you. Yes, and yeah. uh, those those are a wonderful tool for that. Oh look, uh, Williams on top of it too. He had it tight before I could finish thinking it. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, those uh, you can throw it on, use your cell phone camera to take a picture of a breaker panel and see any hot spots right off the bat. So it's a really, really good tool to have. Uh, definitely for a couple of hundred bucks, it's a worthy addition to the laptop bag or the toolkit. And what, another thing to touch on there is the nitrogen tanks and line pressurization. A lot of th people pay attention to you know how many pounds of nitrogen you got in the bottle or is your, is your dehydrator running? No one ever looks at the hoses feeding mm -hmm. from the dehydrator the nitrogen line regulator to the, the to the the manifold and i've come across a lot of 20 30 year old rubber hoses that are just cracked and brittle and they're wondering why they're running through 2500 pounds of nitrogen in three months well yep. you got to change those hoses just the same yep. so one of those things to put on the checklist right just the feed from the uh from the tank to the manifold sometimes mm -hmm. instead of the other so well and the other side to the lines um, exactly Elaine mentions uh that uh as someone who lives in a very dry environment, she can recommend uh, you discharge the static on your own body before you touch anything important at the transmitter site. Uh, and that's a really good point. I know one of the things I recommend, especially if you're in a dry area and you're working with a shop vac, is just take uh, 10 or 15 feet of zip cord, strip six inches and hose clamp it onto the end of your shop vac line and then connect the other end to a known ground point and ground the the shop vac because that that shop vac hose will build up static but uh doing something similar for personal use is, is a really good idea whether it's a static bracelet or whatever uh, one of the ground bracelets I, this is more of a an exotic type of thing but just being me <laughs> uh we actually uh when we redid one of my transmitter sites here for the university we had uh, ordered specific anti-static carpet that has little copper it's like walking on copper wire essentially uh but it's and it, you put a ground underneath the carpet and you take that to your station reference ground well we had some extra of that and i lined around my transmitter with that along with the bracelet tied to the same ground so basically a star point ground so if you're wearing yeah. esd shoes obviously you're not touching that so the bracelet yeah. takes over but if anybody else was to walk in with just standard boots or, or you know even street shoes well, you help a guy out. Make sure you don't kill your equipment the same way. <laughs> yep. So Jerry Olson's asked what uh, debris that is in the photo, and that is the kind of debris that uh, that rodents and uh, critters in Louisiana bring into the average transmitter power supply. That and just uh, general folks working around over the years and not a lot of time with a vacuum. So just just crud and. Louisiana's got the opposite problem, of course. Uh, in this particular case, the, their failure occurred because the humidity got up to about 98.999% and uh, the dirt became quite conductive. But uh, no arcs, just uh, just a bit created a resistor. Um, and the answer, John, point, real quick, is Andrew, it's more of a rug because it's like the carpet tiles, John. It's not actually like high pile shag carpeting from the 70s. Oh, man. Well, that just took... Totally That's in the studios. Me. There you go. I was going to say. 
Yeah, it still collects dirt. Uh, anti-static vinyl tiles, good point. Conductive adhesive, and conductive adhesive is a really good point. Um, a lot of times I'll recommend copper tape for like LTE interference complaints for shielding and things like that, but you've got to get the tape with the conductive adhesive. And yep. uh, you can find, if you Google or search on Amazon for copper tape conductive adhesive, it will hit you with stuff that specifically says the uh, it's got conductive glue on it. So uh, just a, a good point there too. Thanks, John. Um, let's see, I'm missing something here that I wanted to bring up. Uh, due to oh, carpet in a transmitter room, yeah. Um, no, there it is, Mark. Uh, Mark, do you have a microphone? Because you come up with a lot of good points. I may uh, may unmute you to uh, bring this in, but uh, Mark Voris has just uh, mentioned uh, that uh, a really good point, and especially these days, of course, most of us probably have a mask of some sort or another, but uh, not the right kind for this. When you're working with rodent mist, you should definitely be wearing some kind of respiration, respirator. Sorry, I choked on that a little. I'm, I'm fighting a cold here. I uh, promise it's not COVID, already been tested, but uh, still not a lot of fun. So, uh, yeah. Well, I, I know in, when I was in Colorado, yeah. I mean, hantavirus was a big concern at some of the sites from mice, you know, mm -hmm. that, so yeah, you want to protect yourself. Yeah, I walked into a site in Bismarck, North Dakota, and uh, there was a quarter inch of mouse paste on every horizontal surface. And I said, yeah, no, no, not geared for this. So uh, carry on folks. All right, Alan Holmberg, uh, if switching from a tube transmitter to a modern solid state, be aware of new winter heating requirements. That is a really good point. Uh, let's see, in the 80s, our replacement MW1 shut down at minus 50 degrees Celsius, which is about minus 54, 55 Fahrenheit, way, roughly. Cold. <laughs> yeah, when the building propane heater shut down because propane doesn't go gaseous below 42 Celsius. And uh, the original transmitter used to keep itself warm, but the new transmitter couldn't. So it... Uh, got below because what happens when you get below freezing point you get below the condensation point and uh any moisture in the air condenses and tends to uh short things out and shut them down so uh by all means that's uh sometimes it is necessary to have an auxiliary heat source in a room where you may not have had one before you went to the more efficient box so yeah alan that's a really good point thank you for that i, I keep handy a uh a oil filled radiator at my transmitter sites uh, mm -hmm. Just you know, as a space heater, uh, just yep. in case, and, and that warms up the room really well. Now, in the case where I, I was at minus 18, yeah, I had to get out my paint stripper and sit at the back of the transmitter <laughs> and warm up the thermistor so the thing would turn back on while the yep. while the room got warm. But yeah, definitely a good idea to keep handy a couple of space heaters for if you have a, a lot of sites, but don't leave, leave them running unattended. For the love of God, don't do that. Uh, John says run the standby transmitter into the dummy load. Well, that'd, that'd be a good point right there too. Yeah, if your one kilowatt tube rig that uh, will run on that could uh, could mm -hmm. uh, fire up into a dummy load in the building, you create heat that way. Absolutely. So creative engineering, we find solutions to problems nobody ever thought about. Um, John, you're I, assuming I, people have dummy loads. <laughs> I was going to add that. Yes. <laughs> So let's see, my nighttime site has a three kilowatt wall heater that doubles the draw of our site during the winter and typically only at night because the XR3 is pretty efficient. So yeah, same deal. Uh, sometimes you've got to do stuff. I've got a little uh, ceramic heater over in the corner here. I've got a uh, my, my dungeon in the basement, if you will. And uh, sometimes you have to get a little creative in the middle of winter. All right, so speaking of getting creative in the middle of winter, when you're checking your hardware, make sure the door actually closes and latches. Uh, Alex, you want to address this? This is one of your pictures. Yeah, so this site specifically is on the only mountaintop in Minnesota, the, the only hill qualified to be called a mountain in Minnesota. Uh, and the door, you know, typical transmitter building, it's a double double door. You know, it's, it's you know the one side that flashes into the, the jam and then the other one connects to it. Well, uh, somewhere along the line, someone forgot to latch one of the bottom uh, doors, the, 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 the pins that go into the jam, and the door pushed itself open. Uh, it, it has a padlock between the two, so there's a hasp with the lock, so it only opened about this much, but, you know, maybe a five, six inch gap at the most, not enough to even, you know, barely enough to get your hand through. 
but it let this much snow in in an afternoon. So, uh, and the site is inaccessible at this point uh, because it's also a ski hill and the ski hill does not let uh, the guys who use the top of the mountain to do any type of maintenance during the season. Uh, you have to do it in the down times and the off, off times uh, because they're more concerned about public safety, which is completely understandable. I see right. all those meters are at zero. There's that. also an exciter missing if you notice. Uh, there is, yes. <laughs> <laughs> So, and, and to be brutally honest, I don't think there's uh, too many transmitters that are really designed to work in that kind of environment. So, uh, no. Elaine made a, a snarky comment about mountains in Minnesota, and I, I guess it depends on your definition, really. We have tall hills and one mountain. I, there you go. There you go. Yep, sort of same as this part of the world. It, it's what the glaciers left as they headed south. Right. And then remember, this mountain is overlooking Lake Superior, so... Now, one other thing, and really, this is a good one for anybody who lives anywhere where there's any kind of storm season, uh, whether you're south, north, or whatever. With us, we deal with snow. In the southeast, you deal with hurricanes. Southwest, of course, uh, tornadoes, wildfires, whatever. You pick your poison. We all have something. And keep in touch with the folks that will save your butt when uh, things go sideways weather-wise. So you, whether it's your snowplow guy, your generator guy, security folks, whatever. Um, I'm seeing more and more people are saying that it's getting harder to find uh, heating and air conditioning maintenance folks. So if you do find one, buy them lunch or, or something, you know, take, take them out once a year and just make sure that, uh, that they're thinking warm thoughts about you when, uh, when you need them. Know who um, they are and you know who, you know who they are and they know you. Right. Uh, that mountaintop um, site, finding anybody who can do HVAC 30 miles from the Canadian border, pretty challenging. Yeah. Well, if you have a mountain site too, it's finding somebody who can get you there if you can't. I mean, hel helicopter people, uh, somebody so with bad. a sn yeah. snow machine, you know, just anything to get up there. Um, yep. And a lot, lot of those that guys start getting on the back of those things and go. Right. It's real tough trying to put that all together when you're off the air and you're in a hurry, you know. You can right. do that so ahead of time. Having, having the list in advance is, is definitely a good thing. Um, Mark Forrest mentions the power company folks. Uh, one other thing that I think of a lot is uh, phone company. I mean, try to find somebody that knows what ISDN me even means at a phone company anymore. So if you find that person, you hold on to them and uh, treat them really well. Now, Dan, you, you work for a state broadcast association. Do you guys keep reference lists for stuff like that? Like if one of your stations calls or am I giving you a suggestion here? Uh, a little bit of both. I mean, I have lists, but they get outdated rather fast with the turnover sure. that uh, happens. Um, yeah, I, I do get calls and, you know, put people in contact with who I think they ought to be talking to. And then they'll call and then find the right person. And then I'll fix my list afterwards. And that's kind of how we, we go here. So, yeah, yeah, it's it's pretty much a live document. It has to be. And uh, there's one of the things that uh, somebody had mentioned. Uh, let me scroll down to where it was. Uh, yeah, plan for the worst, hope for the best. And we'll uh, talk about that in about two more slides, if I remember. Um, let's see, do any of you need emergency equipment to get rid of the ice around a doorway just to be able to break your way into the building? The short answer Breaker is bars. yes. Yep. Um, whether it's uh, breaker bars, whether it's a pry bar, I carry a roofing shingle shovel, one of those uh, serrated tooth shovels for removing roofing shingles. I usually carry one of those in the back of the truck in the winter. I have a 10 pound ice fishing bar I carry around in the winter oh. time. There you go. Uh, Mark Forrest is suggesting a torch. Yeah, a regular propane torch, assuming you've got a, enough, uh, enough pressure in the tank to uh, keep it lit and it's not too cold to, you know, again, propane doesn't liquid or doesn't go gas well above 40, 40 below. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the, I uh, forget who it was, might've been Gary Langley, but one of the, one or two of the folks in, uh, in Dan, do you remember off the top of your head who suggested the snow shovel where it's accessible, not inside? Uh, <laughs> I do not offhand, no. That's, okay, that's a very good one, that yeah. we talk. And Greg Schmicke over in, uh, in uh, Alex's territory, make sure you have the driveway markers out. That's a really good point. Uh, I've got markers on my driveway here at the house. Uh, and I mean, I, I snow blow, I don't plow, but uh, it's nice to be able to know where the driveway is when you get almost whiteout conditions and four feet of snow on the ground. 
And if you've got uh, cricks running across your property or the driveway crosses a body of water, snow fence is your best friend because if you're calling the local plow company, they don't know your site. You know, they're going to yep. send whoever they hired that fall. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, they don't know where your driveway is. So make sure you mark it. Absolutely. Yep. Yep, and uh, John Antonuk mentions his snow shovel sits just inside the gate so he can shovel his way to the door, which sounds like a, not a lot of fun at all, but uh, Dan's not, and so I'm guessing you found uh, who had mentioned that. Oh, no, I didn't. I'm sorry. Oh, there, see, no, there, there, you had one job, buddy, you had one job. <laughs> um, oh, yeah, I mean, that's, uh, that is one of those little things that's so easy to forget, though. You put the snow, uh, snow shovel inside the building, and then you... Uh, you get going along and uh, you get out there and there's four foot drift in front of the door, you kind of can't get to your shovel. So uh, I also carry one in my, uh, in again, in the back of the truck. I've got a big honk of one of those uh, cargo toolboxes strapped down in the back of the truck for stuff like that. And, it, and it's site specific too, but I, you know, depending mm -hmm. on how far of a drag you got, you know, grab one of the kids toboggans to put your equipment in and pull behind you if you have to, or put behind a snow machine. And drag it along because you never know what you're going to find and what you're going to need. Yeah, Terry yeah. Green contributed. There you that. go. Yes, Terry, appreciate that. I uh, don't Oh, Terry is logged in. Oh, here's another thing, by the way, while I'm thinking about it. Um, so we did rate the Michigan broadcast engineers pretty hard for this. And uh, any of the Michigan engineers who are logged in at the moment, and I see Terry's logged in, I'm not sure who else is here. Uh, there's Rick Grisbeck, but uh, if you send uh, Dan your email address, we'll uh, send you out a little swag kit too. So uh, oh, what's John got here? Somebody mentioned snowshoes. Yep, uh, Paul, good point there. If you've got to get to the site and the snow's three feet deep, trying to drag a sled full of equipment uh, in uh, work boots is a real pain in the rear. Snowshoes help there. Mm -hmm. um, if you have to sweep out the satellite dish, don't keep the push broom indoors it'll melt the snow and clog the broom keep it near the dish and it'll be cold and not clog up so another one from john antonuk and uh yeah one of my sites the door opens outward not a good idea yeah mm -hmm. uh and same situation that's one of those ones where you've got to shovel it that much more before you get inside right um William Harrison mentions carrying a pair of a change of socks and pants and shoes. And uh, I'll tell you right off, I carry in my truck all winter long, there is at least a pair of sneakers and, and a couple of pairs of socks. Um, I like the big wool, wool socks. socks and stuff. Yep, so wool here socks. To tell you, wool socks, yes, but my gold toes are probably the warmest socks I've ever seen. Uh, if you go, I got the first set at Fred Meyer and I've been buying them ever since. So those are my go-tos. Um, wear a hard hat for this, but if your center fed bat wing antennas quit because of the de-icer failure, shaking the guy wires can release enough ice to get you back on the air. Just let you have that one, Alan. <laughs> you got stronger nerves than I got. But yeah. In terms of uh, things to take with you, though, we I think we talked yesterday when we spoke. Uh, you know, food, a little bit of food supplies for yourself, uh, water. Uh, things of that sort because you don't know how long you might be out there or get right. stuck and in a storm coincidentally yep. that will come up in a couple of seconds uh here's a note about um about uh, carrying backup communications whether it's a handheld radio or whatever uh yep i always <laughs> i always believe in and it doesn't matter the time of year summer fall whatever always tell someone where you're going yep and check in very, with those people much. Yep. Even if you uh, have to I mean, work alone, make sure that someone knows where you are. And a little plug here, if anybody is attending the virtual broadcast clinic in that uh, the Wisconsin broadcasters are putting on, I do have a session on exactly that topic in that. Uh, in that. So we pre-recorded, but we'll be live for questions and answers. So happy to see anybody there. Mm -hmm. All right. AM sites. This is what you call a fixer-upper. <laughs> but uh, Rick Grisbeck specifically, who I see online as well. Uh, Rick, do you have a microphone? Because if you got a mic, I'm going to unmute you. I'm going to unmute you anyway. And if you, uh, there you go. Uh, so oh, hello there. Tell me some of the things you had mentioned because, uh, like weep holes in the base insulator, I was aware of, but cracked or missing, missing Johnny balls, missing. Yeah, if you got Johnny a, balls? yeah. Yeah, we had an array down in Florida that uh, 
went through many hurricanes. The towers were in horrible shape and one tower just wouldn't tune up right according to the model. And Trombley went through and counted the Johnny balls on the guy wires and yep, a couple were missing. And that was what was thrown off the AM directional. Wow. Yeah, because at that point, of course, the guy wires are hooked together Touching. and they become part of a top hat almost. Mm -hmm. Yep. Really cool. Now, you had also mentioned, um, let's see, ATU components was the other one that kind of struck my mind. Uh, you were talking a little bit about looking inside. Do uh, you want to tell me more about that? Well, since, you know, people are so busy, sometimes they just don't get out there during the summer and maybe checking on your whole array itself. And there's a good time to go out there now go inside each ATU to see if you have lightning damage, you have collapsed coils because of a lightning strike or a capacitor that's got a blowhole through the side of it because it got whacked by lightning. I was at an array uh, that we built uh, a number of years ago and uh, it was out and went through each ATU and I opened up the door to tower two and everything had this gray soot covered on everything inside there and my eyes went from the top down going what happened in here and you could smell it as i took my eyes down to the bottom here was a capacitor that had horrible lightning damage to it that just blew up and created the soot inside mm -hmm. the whole cabinet so it's good to go through everything make sure everything's tight too because if you've got a directional array with a contactor slamming twice a day they tend to loosen things up, especially around the contactors for the finger stocks, the arms, and and everything else. If you don't check the tightness on things, it's something to do so you don't have to deal with this in the winter time. Right. Excellent. Thanks, Rick. Uh, for anybody listening, Rick is uh, with uh, Mun Reese out of Coldwater, Michigan, and uh, they do quite a bit of consulting and contract work. So uh, you know, there there you go. A little plug for Rick too. Uh, on that note, one of the other things that we've mentioned a few times, and actually I asked once and I didn't see if you replied, uh, Mark Boris, do you have a microphone? Because I see your green now. That's a good sign. You got a note here that ham radio saved your butt a couple of weeks ago. You want to tell us a story? Oh, boy. Yeah. Yeah. Well, one of our sites set is... Um, furthest away from Omaha, I'm right here, and I'm on the east coast of Nebraska, and this site happens to be on the west coast of Nebraska, okay, and it's located up on top of a bluff, and the trail going up to that bluff is quite a rugged trail, um, and I, unfortunately, I got stuck on the way up here a few weeks ago in some soft sand. Well, it happened to be a day that the cellular people decided they were doing maintenance or something because I had no cell service. And I was have been smart enough to throw my handheld radio in the truck that I was using. And that's how I was able to call for help. Um, yep. Made a, you know, a, a, I had help out there in, in short time uh, to get me pulled out. And uh, so don't, you know, if you're a ham radio operator, don't don't think your cell phone is going to be there for you every time because it won't be. Um, well, there's some other things I could mention, too, about that uh, in regards to that site. When you guys go out to start winterizing your sites, try to get the worst sites first while the weather is good. Um, this particular site out there, we've been out there in the wintertime. Uh, where there have been snow drifts, um, we had to take a, a an ATV up to get through the snow drifts. Um, one year, the engineers that worked out there before we got there had to use snowmobiles. Um, also, when it rains out there, the trail gets really slick and nasty. Mm -hmm. um, you won't get up there with a four-wheel drive pickup. Um, I was just up there last week um used a side by side to get up the trail because they had had a little bit of precip out there and it was a little slick in spots um it got us up in good shape um got everything taken care of um uh, again batteries changed thermostats change your battery on the thermostat folks 
Um, the site that we're located at is co-located and the owner of the tower uh, had air conditioning problems in the building and it finally, he said his HVAC guy couldn't find any problems. And I finally said to him, I says, did they check the battery in the thermostat? <laughs> and that was the problem. You know, yep. I mean, uh, it's something that you don't think about. Um, one site that Sometimes. we have, I've got notes next to big, big cards next to the thermostats. Check the batteries. Yep. Sometimes it's a reminder. It's, you know, but if you guys. Stuff. Yep. Yes. Yeah, I have notes those. on my doors. Uh, you know, the first thing, the last thing you see is a giant piece, you know, note. You know, thermostat at seventy-five. Check the battery. Is the remote and yes, uh, remote, is the remote, and remote, not local. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yep. Is the transmitter yes, in local or remote? Again, two hours down the road and think, oh, geez. <laughs> right. And so you got your checklist of four key components right on the door as you're leaving yeah. the building. So sticky notes are fine, guys. I keep notes in my phone even. To, to look mm -hmm. and I'll look at the phone before I leave. Did I make sure, did I get everything done that I needed to get done? Right. Um, because oh. this particular site is not something you just can go access anytime. So mm -hmm. I know it's gonna be months before I get there again, especially right. when so snow you... starts flying and we've had snow out there already. So. Exactly. Well, excellent. Thanks very much for that, Mark. I greatly yeah. appreciate it and uh, really appreciate the input. Thank you. All right, now Duncan mentioned, we haven't had a reason to use it yet, but in addition to the front winch on the truck, we put together a basic recovery kit with a static strap, dynamic strap, tree saver, few pulleys and turn buckles that's always there. And I mean, of course it depends on your budget and your ability to add stuff to your vehicle and modify your vehicle, depending on who owns it. At the very least, and so, there's this website called fivegallonideas.com and you can see the URL at the bottom of the picture because this is where I scavenged the picture from. But uh, at the very least, you're going to want winter tires, chains, depending on your area, and do a, do your basic routine winter maintenance. Uh, Gary Langley made this point, Dan, um, that uh, you know the, the vehicle, your ability to get to a job site can affect your ability to get paid, which impacts your ability to do the maintenance on your vehicle to begin with. So, you know, um, now survival kit. Uh, all three of us live in northern areas. Dan, what do you do for survival kit? Uh, anything specific? Well, as I don't visit transmitter sites except as a tourist these days, I will. Uh, you know, I have a blanket in my car, a first aid kit. Uh, beyond that, not much else. I really should have water and energy bars in the car, but I, I don't. So uh, the water, I don't worry about much. I do carry a sterno can. My theory is that I can always melt snow if I need to. But uh, but yeah, the energy bars are a good idea. Alex, how about you? You do hit a lot of sites and you're uh, oh, yeah. arguably further north than us. Right. Uh, so as you can see behind my wall here, I love my little Sterilite uh, boxes. And I put one of those in each vehicle, uh, one for the wife and kids specifically, you know, there's things in there to keep the kids entertained should the car break down, uh, you know, puzzle, a candle, a couple of candles, uh, because LEDs don't generate heat, guys. Uh, you know, in Minnesota, we can get to 30 below real easy and stay there. I mean, January is pretty normal for us to not get above zero. Uh, so, you know, blankets, um, thermal blankets specifically. Um, you know, like you said, extra socks, um, wool socks specifically, because no one likes wet socks. Um, you know, first aid stuff. Uh, and then uh, I'll put like a, a, a small bag of kitty litter as well to get some traction if you get stuck. Um, you know, it, it, there's actually a pretty big thing around that. And pointing out the chains, it's not as needed. It's where is allowed. You can't have chains True. in Minnesota. Um, so you, you have to go with the flow. So make sure you got your winter tires checked out, put on, if you need them, have them. Um, you know, and remember guys, they, they have a shelf life too. Just cause you use them half a year doesn't mean they're good for 20 years. They do dry rot. Um, so right. you're going to have to do that, you know, wipers and such like that. But inside the car itself, you know, it's two of these little sterilites, one for the kid, one for the wife, including, uh, as I grab it to Mark's point, a walkie talkie. Um, you know, yes, they're family radio stuff, not necessarily ham radio, uh, but you'll, you're, you're going to be more likely to find someone, 
uh, using the family radio service or, or you know GMRS type of thing. Uh, the ham radios are good ideas, but my wife has no interest. So uh, yeah. it is what it is. But uh, mm -hmm. those types of things are definitely a necessity uh, in a vehicle, especially in rural Minnesota, or, you know, think the Dakotas where you're a hundred miles to the nearest town, you know, break down or get thrown into the ditch on a side wind, which has mm -hmm. happened. It could take three, four hours for a tow truck to get to you. Right. You know, and what if you only had an eighth of a tank of gas and you were hoping and praying and knowing your vehicle, right? How many mm -hmm. of us haven't done that? Well, uh, uh, <laughs> winter, winter time, I tend to focus. My father always told me it costs the same amount to keep the top half full as the bottom half. So <laughs> that's the way I ride in the winter time, especially. Right. E means uh, enough, right? Now, one thing Mark mentioned is spare medications. In case you get stranded, you will have your meds. And it, that's a really good point. If you're, especially if you're on anything critical and prescription, you should always have some extra day or two's worth with you. Uh, Curtis Stefan mentions, make sure the kitty litter is the non-clumping kind. Yep. Um, and Dennis Switzer mentions that a roll of toilet paper stays clean, dry, and away from the mice when it's kept in a plastic Folgers coffee can. And yep, I carry one of those in the back of my truck as well. The back of my truck, well, like I say, I've got a, a box, a plastic toolbox that takes up the front two heat feet of the box of my truck. And that's the kind of stuff that's in it. Mm -hmm. Now, Ray Lewis asked a UPS question, and there's a good one that I'm not aware of. Has anybody tried the new seven amp hour lithium batteries for UPS? They're about three times the cost, same size, but supposed to last longer. Any, either of you guys know anything about them? I have a site no. that uh, actually bought one of the Tesla Power Walls, and that's yeah. their UPS. Hmm. Uh, that's it's an expensive UPS. I mean, that thing right. was 10 grand to put in, but. Tesla maintains it, the whole nine. It's got a service contract attached to it. The transfer switch works perfectly, tests every time. Mm -hmm. and, and it's got two uh, AM transmitters on it and a small FM translator. I mean, we're, we're constantly pulling about five kilowatts off the wall on that thing. Wow. It doesn't care. Hmm. That's interesting, huh? Good point. Now uh, that uh, we're running past the top of the hour, what else is new? Uh, once I get talking, it's hard to stop me sometimes. Uh, well, this, this is a topic little, that affects everybody. It does, and and again, a lot of it, whether you're up north or down south, the uh, it, it applies in different ways. Um, the last thing to mention is, in addition to our normal resources, I've added a link here that uh, came in from one of Dan's engineers on uh, John Bissett with Telos had written a great article. And anybody yeah, who doesn't know John, he does uh, he does tips and tricks and workbench and yeah, everything. Rick uh, Grisbeck uh, posted that one. Oh, well, thanks, Rick. And so now anybody who isn't aware, the SBE has got a new website as of a couple of days ago. It is awesome. So uh, Rick's link is no, is broken. This is the current link for that. Um, so I, I did look it up this morning. <laughs> but uh, that, that's a, there, there's a couple of good uh, white papers in there as well. So I want to thank everybody for uh, for coming in today especially you know all y'all that uh provided input it's been an awesome awesome day uh i want to throw special thanks over to uh dan for working so much with the michigan engineers and i just want to thank the engineers for doing you know helping us out and getting all the materials together so that that was a great time and uh alex i want to thank you for taking time out of your day uh john wilton if you're still listening thanks for letting me have alex for a couple hours <laughs> Thanks, all boss. right. On, <laughs> on that note, I want to thank you all, and we hope to see you again. Let's see. Today is the 6th. Next week is the 13th. I think next week we're going to talk a little bit about HD radio, and then uh, I forget what else we've got coming up. It's uh, You can find it all on our website. So, folks, thank you very much. Have a wonderful day.